Hi, my name is Cesar de la Fuente and I'm a presidential assistant professor at the University of Pennsylvania. It is a true honor to have received the 2021 CSM Thermo Fisher Award. I'm particularly proud to be joining incredibly accomplished colleagues that have received this award in previous years. So today I thought I'd tell you about some of the work that we've been doing in my lab where our goal is to be able to better understand, prevent, and treat infectious diseases. In particular, today I'll focus on efforts in trying to use computers to design novel classes of antibiotics. And I'll touch upon a little bit on our work um, trying to develop low cost diagnostics for COVID-19 and other infectious diseases. So we've seen two major trends in the past decades. One of them is that it is increasingly expensive to take a drug from the laboratory to the clinic. As of today, uh, it costs over $1 billion uh, to uh, develop a new drug. This, just to put it in context, this is more than the budget that NASA has to take a rocket to the moon. And not only is it incredibly expensive to develop new drugs, but uh, it also takes a long time. So on average, it takes around 10, 10 years to take one lab all the way to, to the clinic and to, you know, so that it can be utilized by, by society. At the same time, we've seen a concomitant increase in our ability to compute. Um, and this is uh, driven by Moore's law, uh, basically um, dictating the number of transistors that you can fit in a chip, which has exponentially increased as we can see in this graph on the right uh, over time. So we have all this ability to process information on the computer. Um, and at the same time, we have an incredible ability today to generate data. Um, and so what we're trying to do in my lab is we're trying to combine these two trends to see if we can train computers uh, for drug discovery. Um, so they can enable us to decrease the time scale that it takes to develop a new drug. And so that it can, they can help us uh, decrease the cost um, associated with discovering new, uh, new potential life-saving medicines. And in particular, we focus on antibiotics. And the reason for this is that the current projections is that 10 million people will die every single year in the world by 2050 if we don't develop any new antibiotic strategies that are effective. In fact, if we compare those number of deaths with every other major cause of death in our society, we can see that the, at least the estimation is that uh, uh, drug resistant bacteria will uh, kill more people every year than every other uh, cause of death, as we can see here, including cancer. And those 10 million deaths per year, if you do the math, it corresponds to one death every three seconds. So this is the future where we're heading. It is a post-antibiotic era. I think here it's important to emphasize um, the role that antibiotics have in our society. Uh, so first of all, from a historical perspective, um, humans have been able to practically duplicate our lifespan uh, through three major pillars, right? Uh, vaccines, antibiotics, and clean water. And antibiotics are not only useful uh, to, to clear infections, but they're also essential for modern medicine to, to exist really. So they, they play key roles in, um, in things like surgeries, even minor surgeries. Uh, they play a key role in childbirth, uh, they play a key role in, in chemotherapy treatment for, for cancer patients. And so they're really these huge treasures that permeate uh, all of uh, every single or, or many different medical interventions that are critical to our day-to-day -day operations as a society. And historically, antibiotics have derived from nature. Uh, from the discovery of the first one, which was penicillin in 1928 by Alexander Fleming, 
And a lot of the other structures that we have been able to discover, they actually derive from the biological world around us. The problem is that for decades now, we have been unable to uh, discover any new antibiotic chemistries in the natural world. And so the hypothesis, one of the hypotheses that we have in, in my lab is that perhaps nature has run out of inspiration and through the evolutionary process has already, um, you know, has only yielded so many chemistries with these uh, antibiotic properties. And we've perhaps already sampled and explored and identified all the interesting molecules that were uh, there to be identified. And so what we're trying to do is to trying to think a little bit outside the box in the lab. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to encode all these chemistries into ones and zeros on the computer so then computers can take care of the discovery process as opposed to humans having to rely on uh, nature's inspiration through the evolutionary process to provide us with these uh, miracle drugs. And so that, then the next question is which compounds uh, out of all the ones that nature has provided can we focus on uh, so that we can encode them onto computers? And if you explore the tree of life, actually you will find a family of tiny proteins called host defense peptides or HDPs for short, which have intrinsic antibiotic properties. And the really interesting thing about these molecules is that they're very small, so between 10 and 50 amino acids in length. So you can encode them, uh, you can encode them um, genetically as, as I'm uh, mentioning on the slide, of course, because they're composed of amino acids, so you can encode them on DNA. You can also make them chemically in the laboratory very easily. Um, and uh, they represent just excellent scaffolds um, as novel antibiotics. And as I'm showing here how, just to illustrate how these molecules are generated throughout the tree of life. So bacteria produce them, uh, as we can see here, insects, mammals, in fact, humans, we produce these HDPs as part of our immune system. They help us fight off invading organisms. And so how do we engineer these HDPs? Well, traditionally we've used very um, uh, classical rules from protein engineering that essentially tell us that the structure of a protein or a peptide determines its function. Um, and therefore, if we can control the sequence of amino acids, which are the building blocks of these molecules, we'll be able to control their biological function, their ability to target bacteria. So essentially we're playing Lego with these molecules in the laboratory to be able to find those arrangements of amino acids in specific positions that allow us to uh, create novel synthetic versions that are more effective and perhaps more promising at killing uh, drug resistant bacteria. But in recent years, we've incorporated, in addition to these traditional rules, uh, we've incorporated concepts from other disciplines, including computer science, uh, physics, chemistry, and synthetic biology in in a, an inter interdisciplinary uh, field that we're calling machine biology at that intersection between uh, utilizing machines to understand and harness biology. And the framework that we follow in trying to um, engineer these uh, this biological molecules, these peptides, is first we try to understand them from first principles, meaning the underlying chemistry and physics that dictate how this uh, molecules operate and how uh, changes to those molecules influence their biological function. Once we've reached that level of understanding, we're in a good position to be able to control these, uh, these, uh, these peptides in the laboratory, both chemically and biologically. And I'll talk about each of those uh, two options. And once we've reached a level of control, we're in a good position to start transmitting, transferring that knowledge onto the computers. So again, the computers can take care of the, the rest. And I think the first two steps, the understanding and controlling are, are essential uh, because it would be very difficult to teach a computer something that we don't, uh, that humans don't fully um, or at least partially understand well. So today I'd like to tell you about stories from each of those efforts. Um, and I'm going to start with the understand effort. So here we, we started off with this, uh, this uh, peptide molecule derived from the venom 
of this Brazilian wasp called Polybia paulista. This molecule has an interesting history because when it was first described in the literature, it generated, generated a lot of excitement because it had good antimicrobial properties. However, it had these highly undesired toxicities, right? That were not uh, really resolved. And so this compound was essentially forgotten in the literature for many, many years. And we decided to pick it up as a challenge to see if we could essentially reprogram it to preserve the antimicrobial properties that we want while removing the um, deleterious uh, cytotoxicity associated with this molecule. So we're playing, playing, playing Lego with the molecule, right? To try to uh, mutate it in a brute force approach um, to try to filter out those amino acids uh, that were associated with antimicrobial activity and cytotoxicity. So these are some of the physical chemical descriptors. Again, the physical and um, uh, chemical attributes of these molecules that we consider. So secondary structure, hydrophobicity, motif, motifs and uh, different motifs and patterns, and net chart. And we utilize that uh, to make uh, uh, rational uh, mutations uh, that then we, uh, we use to synthesize the molecules chemically, and we tested them against a number of bacteria uh, performing MIC or minimal inhibitory concentration assays. This uh, allow us to basically determine the minimal concentration of each of the molecules that we've generated uh, that, are, that is necessary to kill bacteria. Here I'm just showing uh, some of the results that we obtained using uh, clinically relevant uh, bacterial pathogens, including Staph aureus and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And essentially you see uh, a very colorful picture here. And the different colors just represent different ability of each of those mutants that we generated to kill each of those microbes that I'm showing there. But all you need to know basically is that uh, the different mutations created a huge diversity in terms of uh, ability to target each of those two pathogens. So we learn a lot of things from this uh, approach. Um, so this is how we draw uh, the, 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 the pet pet on a piece of paper on, in two dimensions. Uh, Basically, you have these very two, two very distinct phases, this one here and then this one here. And what we learn is that if you, if you mutated this amino acids here uh, indicated um, by the blue arrows, that less, led to decreased function. And conversely, if you mutated this amino acids indicated by the red arrows here, that led to increased function. And so we acquire knowledge to now be able to uh, rationally say, okay, I'm going to mutate this particular amino acid in order to either increase or decrease the biological output uh, of the resulting molecule. We're also able to map uh, uh, ranges of psychochemical descriptors, such as alpha helical propensity, hydrophobicity, et cetera, um, to, to, to specific values that again, associated with uh, the blue or loss of function and the red or gain of function. And then we use all that information to create new synthetic versions of the molecules uh, to be able to, to see if, if, if those substitutions or modifications were able to improve the biological activity. So again, we use all that knowledge to be, to be able to control these peptides uh, chemically in the laboratory using the physical chemical uh, this physical chemical guided approach that I've mentioned. And uh, the resulting synthetic versions, uh, we tested against a number of different bacterial species, including a lot of different pathogens. Uh, and we got really a, a positive correlation between the predicted uh, activity uh, that we expected and the resulting activity that we obtained in these, uh, in these experiments. And by the end of all this iterative approach, we're able to isolate lead peptides that were no longer hemolytic or cytotoxic, uh, which remember was the original purpose of the whole project because we wanted to reprogram the venom uh, peptide into something that would no longer be toxic. So we successfully did that. And then the next step was, um, was you know, the quest to ask the question, do these uh, peptides have uh, anti-infective properties in a mouse model? So we developed a skin infection 
mouse model and we challenged the mice with bacteria and then treated them with the peptide to see how they um, how they uh, functioned in that uh, sort of more realistic setting. And here we have some of the results. We have the different uh, peptide sequences, including the, uh, the, the, the control from the venom. Um, in the y-axis, we have CFU per milliliter that essentially gives you a sen sense of how many bacteria you have in the infection. Uh, and we can see generally that the red peptides, which remember were the gain of function, uh, they resolve the infection better than the blue peptides, which were the, the loss of function uh, uh, compounds. And then the untre untreated uh, group of mice is, is indicated here by the, by the black color. So this was really, uh, really nice to see correlation between the antimicrobial properties of each of these different variants that we created um, in vivo with respect to in vitro. And then the next question was, could we use any of these um, in a realistic model such as this one it, it, as a novel antibiotic? And so what we did is we took the best one that decreased the infection the most. We, um, we increased the concentration uh, from four micromolar to 64 micromolar. And the, the results were, were quite outstanding uh, in, in this particular case. Uh, after four days, peptide treatment led to complete resolution of the infection, um, uh, which is not something that we had seen before in the context of this mouse model with other antibiotics or other synthetic uh, compounds that we had designed. So that was very exciting. Um, and we're uh, currently pursuing uh, this lead compound uh, as a potential antibiotic. So in terms of our work with venoms, um, we believe that venoms are a, a, you know, they're a previously unexplored potential source of novel antibiotics. And so what we did in this case is we, we, um, we took a computational approach where computationally we identified a motif composed of five amino acids, this pentapeptide here indicated in red, that were associated um, in different databases associated with predicted antimicrobial and immunomolatory properties. And what we then did is we took this toxic molecule from a venom that has this sequence outlined here, and we engineered in that motif on its end terminus to generate this synthetic version of the molecule, again, with that penta motif on the, on the end terminus indicated by the red color here. So the hypothesis was that by incorporating a motif that had these predicted uh, functions, the resulting molecule would incorporate those, uh, those capabilities. And we're able to demonstrate that that was a case where the synthetic uh, compound uh, was able to resolve infections not only by directly targeting the microbes, but also indirectly by boosting the immune response of the host, in this case, the mice, and also balancing inflammation. And inflammation, uh, as the audience probably, probably knows, uh, is it's really critical whenever you have an infection, you need the inflammatory, uh, an inflammatory response to help you resolve the infection. But oftentimes it can become exacerbated and uh, that can lead to, uh, to sepsis, which can be, be incredibly lethal in a matter of, um, of hours to days. And so it was great to see that this synthetic peptide that we created um, had the dual activity, activity um, which we demonstrated in, in numerous experiments uh, in this work and, um, and including a mouse model, uh, the mouse skin infection model here. And then additionally, in a sepsis infection model, this is a systemic infection model where we challenge the, the mice with uh, laboratory bacterial strains and also uh, drug resistant strains from hospitals and treatment with the peptide was able to confer protection against those otherwise lethal infections um, in, those, in those contexts. And just to highlight some of the relevance of, of, of some of these findings, um, it's important to note this statistic from 2017 uh, that basically tells us that sepsis killed 11 million people per year as of 2017, as I mentioned there. Sepsis is also uh, relevant in the context of the current COVID pandemic where uh, a lot of individuals uh, have uh, uh, obviously viral infections that can lead to septicemia, but also uh, in a lot of cases, we're seeing um, uh, secondary bacterial infections 
that can also lead to sepsis. And so incredibly lethal, very difficult to treat with conventional antibiotics. Okay, so I've told you how we can, um, not only we're trying to understand these molecules, we're starting to understand them quite well. We can now control them in laboratory relatively well uh, using chemical means. And now I'd like to tell you about how we can control them in the laboratory using biological means. And the, what enables this is that, of course, peptides are composed of amino acids. And so um, essentially um, you can encode them on DNA and that opens up a lot of possibilities uh, that I'm mentioning here where you can, um, you can encode them into living cells such as yeast or bacteria uh, onto their genomes. And uh, there are a number of applications that you may wanna do this for, for example, for lowering the cost of manufacturing of peptides and proteins. Here, we're really lagging behind still with respect to, um, to, to DNA that today uh, we can synthesize very easily and inexpensively. Uh, you can use them to create uh, high diversity libraries uh, and also uh, as living medicines. You may envision having a, for example, a probiotic bacterium, such as the ones that we, we eat in our yogurt. Um, you can engineer them and endow them with the ability to produce some of these peptides uh, in a way that you would be eating an engineer microbe uh, that is incorporated into your yogurt. It would go through your stomach, it would reach your colon, your gut, it would colonize it, and then in real time, it would be uh, producing and secreting some of these therapeutic peptides that could have, um, again, beneficial um, outcomes. But today for this, the, the, in the context of this talk, I'm going to focus on the manufacturing approach. So this is um, essentially the architecture that, that we used. And um, we focus on yeast cells as uh, factories for the production of these molecules. And uh, in the uh, engineering approach, we use a, a, a carrier protein called HSA that stands for um, human serum albumin that essentially brings stability to the complex. And then we have, we can input here any peptide sequence we want. So this is just a code of amino acids um, that is plug and play. And we engineer in a cleavage site that allows us to cleave off the peptide once we've generated sufficient quantities of it. Um, the strategy uh, works as follows. So you have your uh, yeast genome, in this case, Pika pastoris, um, that contains a recombination site, which is this red triangle. Then at the same time, you have a plasmid, which is this circular piece of DNA here that also contains a recombination site, which is this blue triangle. And it also has a promoter, which is a, a piece of DNA essentially that promotes the expression of whatever comes afterwards. And afterwards we have our peptide code essentially. So what happens is that if we add to, to the reaction, if we add a recombinase, which is this enzyme um, illustrated by this blue cloud, uh, what it does is it recombines these two sites, therefore allowing integration of the plasmid into the genome of the yeast. And um, what this means is that the yeast now becomes a factory, uh, a robust factory for the production of these therapeutic molecules. This is just to show the, the workflow where uh, by the end of the experiments, you have your peptide of choice separated from the fusion protein. Um, and of course, in each case, we validate the antimicrobial activity of every uh, peptide that we generate in this fashion. So because one of the goals of this project was to try to decrease the cost of peptides, uh, we next uh, decided to scale up production using a bioreactor. Um, and one of the interesting things about our system is that the, uh, the production of the peptide uh, um, can be induced um, by uh, adding methanol into the medium, which basically induces the, the promoter in such a way that if we add methanol into the medium, uh, we can see how the yeast starts producing the protein uh, over time. And this, this is essentially the same upon addition of methanol into the medium. Over time, we see increased production of our desired product. And so how does this compare in terms of the cost with, uh, with traditional methods for synthesizing uh, peptides? Well, we ran a quick uh, back of the envelope calculation and uh, with traditional methods, essentially uh, solid phase chemical synthesis, which is the chemical uh, method that uh, everybody uses to synthesize these molecules. Um, 
to, to generate one milligram, you need between a hundred and a thousand dollars. Using this yeast-based synthetic biology system, you can do it for less than one dollar. Although, admittedly, this does, does not include in the calculation uh, purification costs that would add uh, more 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 costs associated with each of those two processes. But nevertheless, we're excited about the prospect of using living medicines as uh, uh, production machines, uh, really for uh, to be able to manufacture and, and produce uh, some of these therapeutic uh, peptides and proteins at scale. And finally, so now I've told you how uh, we can, uh, we're starting to understand these molecules, we can control them chemically and biologically. And now we're in a good position to start to transfer all that knowledge onto computers. And I'm going to tell you a couple of stories uh, around some of these concepts. Computers, what they, they allow us uh, to do is uh, really they can enable us to explore the sequence space of proteins and peptides to try to find a, a new sequences that may help us uh, address present day problems. And one of them, of course, is the problem at hand here, which is antibiotic resistance. And just to illustrate the almost infinite nature of these molecules, I'm going to show you uh, the sequence space of different concepts that may be more familiar to the audience. So for example, the number of people on Earth is 10 to the 10, the number of, you know, if you keep going to higher order magnitude, the number of stars in the universe is 10 to the 31. Well, sequence space of a very small peptide composed of 25 amino acids, um, basically one after the other in a linear chain. Um, and again, this is a peptide a lot smaller than any protein that we would have in our bodies that would be composed of hundreds of amino acids. That gives us a, a combinatorial sequence space that is superior to the number of stars in the universe, as we can see here. So this is fascinating. And to make things even more interesting, biological evolution through billions of years has only sampled a tiny fraction of the entire space of possibilities of all potential molecules, illustrated here by all the white space. So what we're trying to do computationally, we're trying to expand the boundaries of sequence space to be able to reach some of these wide areas that have not been explored throughout evolution. Because we think that perhaps some, in some of those wide and explored areas, we may find new molecules that may help us treat you know, the diseases that we need to treat today, including antibiotic resistant infections. So clearly we needed computers to be able to take on these exploratory efforts. And at the same time, we needed to find a way to create diversity, to innovate molecularly. And so it took us a while, we were thinking and brainstorming, you know, what is the best way to innovate at the molecular level? And of course, one day the light bulb lit up and uh, you know, we asked the question, well, how, how, how have we evolved, humans evolved from the very first organisms that inhabited earth? And that is of course, through the evolutionary process. So what we decided to do is we decided to train computers to execute Darwin's algorithm of evolution, but instead of following, strictly following the, the rules of, of natural selection, in this case, we, the computer performed artificial selection because instead of having to wait millions of years for things to evolve, in this case, molecules, we could do that in a time scale of days. So we really compressed the evolutionary process on the computer. This is how we did it. We started with an initial population of peptides, the HTPs derived from nature. And then we taught the computer how to evolve them through mutation, selection, recombination, and then n fold iterations of that process in a feedback loop um, that essentially mimic it, uh, the evolutionary process. Here we, ha we have one of the, the, the optimizations processes where we can see that upon increased number of iterations, we see how the computer evolves the molecules towards 
optimal fitness values that correlate with predicted antibiotic activity. This is all driven by this fitness function here. So not only is the computer evolving the molecules to make them better at killing bacteria, but it's also exploring some of the white space that I mentioned earlier, some of that unexplored, previously unexplored sequence space. And in fact, the computer was able to create new peptide sequences that have amino acid compositions that are not what we typically find in the biological world. Here I'm showing some of the structures that the computer generated, again, with very minimal human intervention up to this point. You can see those beautiful alpha, alpha helices. But again, here we reach a roadblock that is common to any project using computer. And that is that everything that we see on the screen is just a prediction. You know, in, the computer thinks that this peptides in particular will be able to target bacteria but we still need to validate this, right? And in my laboratory, uh, we really uh, focus a lot of our, our efforts in validating everything experimentally. So we have both a computational side and experimental side to the lab. So that's what we did. We chemically synthesized a lot of these molecules and we tested them against actual bacteria, real bacteria in the laboratory. We're able to identify the lead compound that had a very low MIC. This basically means that you need a very low dose of the peptide to target bacteria effectively. In particular, if we compare it to some of the peptides that the computer started this the optimization process with, which were essentially not very good antimicrobial, as we can see here. And we did this on purpose to demonstrate as a proof of principle that a computer could train a, could turn a non-active molecule or a zero into a very active molecule or a one. This is the three-dimensional structure as elucidated using NMR of the lead compound. You can see again, this beautiful alpha helical structure and here the alpha helical structure also in 3D space. As mentioned earlier in my lab, we pay a lot of attention to translating everything we find, every discovery we make into something that may help improve the world in some way. And so we always want to translate things. So we wondered whether these machine-made molecules could perhaps kill bacteria in a mouse model, could resolve an infection in a preclinically relevant mouse model. And these are some of the results for, from those mouse experiments. The machine-made peptides resolved the infections much better than two of the molecules that we started the computational optimization process with. And here we have the untreated control um, a group of mice that were non treated, just as a reference. So, we believe this opens up a, a new field to, that tries to use computational tools, including tools from AI, to be able to design novel classes of antibiotics uh, to treat drug resistant infections. And perhaps some of these concepts that we're developing, we're starting to develop, um, may be able to be used. Uh, or extrapolated to other fields as well. In addition to using computers to, to design novel antibiotics, we also want to use them to discover new ones. And the truth is that in biology, we have a lot of code, um, both DNA and amino acid code, that has not really been decrypted or deciphered, but it really, encapsulates a lot of information that constitutes molecules that may be of interest. So to try to address this, to try to find new antibiotics in biological databases, in other words, to try to mine biology, what we did is we took inspiration from image recognition and speech recognition algorithms, but instead of recognizing facial expressions or sounds, which by the way, we do every single day with the cell phones that we that we have, we wanted to recognize amino acid patterns that were associated with antibiotic molecules. So to illustrate how this works, we, we can have a protein in three dimensions here. We can display it in two dimensions and the algorithms, what they do is they run through the code of amino acids and they identify regions of predicted antimicrobial properties. 
these are given by these different colors that we see here. And this is all provided by an antimicrobial score that we've developed. Again, just a computational prediction, but a very powerful one because it's a, it allows us to identify regions within entire proteins, such as this region in yellow here, that constitute potential antibiotics. And then what we can do in the laboratory is we can extract those regions from the entire molecule, and we can try to develop them into new drugs in the lab. What we've done is we've applied this algorithm to the whole the entire human body to try to find what we call encrypted antibiotics in the human body. What we found is thousands of new encrypted peptide antibiotic molecules in our own bodies, hidden within our own bodies that we have not really identified before. And what was really fascinating about this result is that these molecules were not only encoded in the innate immune system, which is where you would imagine they would find them, right? The innate immune system is the system in our bodies responsible for providing protection against invading organisms to protect ourselves. But we also found, found them hidden in larger proteins from the nervous system, the cardiovascular system, and the digestive systems, among, among others. The hypothesis that we currently have based on this data is that our own bodies are comparing uh, protection against invading organisms in a holistic fashion, not only through the immune system, but through many other systems all around. So I'm gonna tell you about a couple of properties that we found from these encrypted peptides um, from the human body that were interesting to us. So one of them here on the left is that if you take some of these peptides from the same biogeographical area throughout the body, they synergize with each other, meaning they potentiate, they potentiate each other's activity to target pathogens, to nanomolar range, incredibly low doses of, of peptide needed uh, in combination in cocktails to target pathogens. Another really interesting thing, and of course a property that we want in any antibiotic that we try to develop, is that bacteria have a hard time developing resistance to these encrypted molecules. Here we have uh, an experiment where we, we, we expose the, the Acinetobacter baumani in this case, continuously to three of the encrypted molecules and a conventional antibiotic, polymixin B, and we can see how the bacteria eventually develop resistance to polymixin B but not to uh, the human molecules. In this slide this is just to illustrate that there's physiological relevance to the molecules that we've discovered. They are produced in different biogeographical areas throughout the body and at different levels, as you can see in the scale here, this color scale. And of course, the next step is we wanted to ask the question, you know, do, do these molecules have anti-infective properties? And so what we did is we treated mice, infected mice with the, this encrypted peptides, both in monotherapy and in combination therapy. And we found a significant decrease in the infection, both in, in monotherapy and in combination therapy against a number of clinical, clinically relevant pathogens. Here, uh, this is another uh, project, and this is just to illustrate that we're also interested in producing uh, antibacterial materials. This is particularly relevant in the context of a pandemic where we're afraid to uh, touch um, a keyboard or any other high touch areas, including uh, a doorknob or um, in the case of a surgical table, absolutely, we want, we want it to be antimicrobial. And we're working on developing such materials. And here, we developed an ionic liquid based material uh, that um, against which bacteria do not develop resistance. Here we have experiments with Walter E. coli, a cholestin resistant E. coli. This is cholestin, it's a last resort antibiotic. Um, don't develop resistance to these materials. And also a hypermutant E. coli strain that is very good at um, evolving and therefore developing resistance to anything that you uh, expose it to. And it was also unable to develop resistance to our materials. And the really interesting thing from a translational standpoint is that you can use the materials to coat different surfaces, including glass, plastic, and medical catheters. And they really prevent uh, colonization by bacteria and they prevent biofilm formation as well. Just to illustrate that we're also interested in that aspect of applying 
uh, our knowledge and our expertise in the lab to uh, creating uh, antimicrobial materials. So to summarize some of the things that, I, that I've told you today, um, we're using computers to design and discover novel antibiotics. And now what we'd like to do in the short term is we'd like to couple that with a synthesizer, a robot that essentially will synthesize whatever molecules the computer tells you to synthesize, and then further streamline that to a screening um, a machine that will screen the molecules for antimicrobial activity in order to be able to identify lead compound. And then we're building machine learning models to couple those results back to the computer to, get, to sort of create a autonomous platform for antibiotic discovery to really be able to accelerate um, uh, the, the rate of antibiotic development. This graph, this is to illustrate how young this field is. This is a retrospective study that we, we did in the lab where we're comparing PubMed results of published papers uh, with uh, queries uh, including AI plus antibiotics, AI plus cancer therapeutics, and AI plus drugs in general. And we can see that the AI plus antibiotics field uh, really did not exist before 2018. So it's an incredibly young field. And um, if there's anybody in the audience interested in, in working at this intersection, uh, uh, please, we need more uh, young minds uh, thinking about some of these problems to really be able to tackle this global health uh, crisis, uh, this uh, silent pandemic of uh, antibiotic resistance. So we really encourage you uh, to get involved. And finally, I'd like to talk briefly about our efforts in, uh, in, in the context of the COVID pandemic. Um, so just to, to put this into context, we were working on developing low-cost diagnostics. So one of the things that we believe in in, our, in my lab is that uh, we want to uh, prevent uh, the spread of infections. And a really good tool for that is diagnostics, rapid diagnostics. Um, in the context of the pandemic, we've seen, uh, I mean, it's quite clear how uh, having a, a rapid and low-cost diagnostic could be an, an, a critical element to prevent the spread of the infection, uh, to prevent outbreaks, to prevent hospitalizations, and to prevent multiple, you know, millions of deaths. And we knew it had to be low cost in order to be able to, um, to make it accessible to everyone, not only people with economic means, but also, uh, you know, people uh, that live in, in, in low research settings or that live in, um, in, um, in, in low income communities or people that live in developing countries. We're seeing now our friends in, in Brazil and in India uh, suffering tremendously from, um, from, from COVID and, uh, and uh, in, a, in a really dramatic situation. And so really, we really focus on, on trying to develop something that was low cost and, and rapid. What we came up with um, was a, this technology uh, called electrochemistry, which essentially allows you to transform the chemical information derived from the binding of the virus to a receptor uh, into an electrical signal that we can detect, we can detect or pick up very rapidly. And uh, so we can uh, print these electrodes with an electrical circuit in them. We can print them using a, a printer similar to a 3D printer, it's called a screen printer. And, and then we, what we did is we functionalized the electrodes with ACE2, which is a natural receptor of SARS-CoV-2 in our own body. So we mimic, we wanted to mimic that interaction between the virus, um, the spike protein of the virus, the spike protein is the, the main antigen, the main protein on the surface of the virus, and the, its receptor in our own bodies, ACE2. Um, and and then that's what we did. And we demonstrated uh, detectability uh, of the virus, both in saliva samples and in nasopharyngeal and oropharyngeal samples. This technology is compatible with your cell phone. So uh, you can have the electrode here, the chip, um, again, with the ACE2 functionalized onto it. And you can deposit a saliva sample, for example. And then um, uh, this machine called a potential stat will trans transform the chemical information into an electrical signal that will then be transmitted to your phone. And through an app, you can visualize whether your sample um, is infected with the virus or whether it's healthy. And this is sort of um, what it allows you to do is, again, discriminate infected from 
from uh, non-infected samples. And here are some of the properties uh, or performance metrics of the test. Again, this is the just the first prototype. We've developed two more um, uh, that are in different process of uh, different uh, steps of, of, of publication. Uh, but yeah, the limit of detection of this particular one is, is quite low, around one PFU per milliliter. This is within the range of PCR, qPCR. Uh, the time of detection is four minutes, so it's very rapid. So we really successfully achieved that speed of detection that we wanted. And the cost is, is quite low, less than $5 per test. Again, uh, successfully achieving that low cost metric that we really wanted to hit. And then this is just a graph showing the price to detection time uh, matrix of uh, our technology, uh, which we call rapid uh, in relation to other existing uh, tests that are FDA approved. And with that, um, I'd like to thank, to thank the team that really uh, is the heart of everything that I presented. It's really a privilege to work with uh, such um, diverse uh, people that come from all over the world to work here uh, in the lab and that bring perspectives that are incredibly different. And, uh, and again, highly interdisciplinary. We have people from chemistry, from computer science and physics, from microbiology, of course, from synthetic biology, um, and so on. And so it's really, really a pleasure to work with them every single day. And also, of course, our funders uh, that allow us to do the work that we do. And then here I'm leaving uh, links to our website, to my email address and social media in case anybody wants to get in touch uh, uh, with follow-up questions or anything like that. And with that, um, again, to, just wanted to reiterate that it's uh, a true honor and privilege to, to have been awarded this uh, uh, Thermo Fisher Award, and um, I'd love to, you know, thank you for your attention. Uh, I'd love to take any questions you may have.